This is Al Jazeera. Hello and welcome, I'm Peter Dobby. You're watching the News Hour live from Doha. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. A 10-hour siege at a hotel in the Somali capital is over, but at least 23 are dead. Under pressure, after a controversial referendum, Iraq's Kurdish leader is reportedly considering standing down. Kenya's opposition leaders contemplate their next move as the fallout from the presidential election rerun continues. Down there is its lava lake. And from where we're standing, you can feel the heat and smell the sulfur. And we'll take you up close to one of Africa's most active volcanoes. Al-Shabaab says it was behind a siege at a hotel in the Somali capital, Mogadishu, that lasted for more than 10 hours. At least 23 people died. Five fighters stormed the building on Saturday after twin bombings in the area and took people hostage. The security forces killed two attackers and arrested three others. Catherine Soy reports now from neighbouring Kenya. Hours after the attack on a hotel in Mogadishu, volunteers and rescue workers are still clearing the debris and pulling out more bodies. The siege is over, and once again residents of this city are in mourning. Just two weeks after another attack, the worst in Somalia's history, close to 400 people were killed and dozens are still missing. Two of the attackers were killed and three others were captured alive after a 10-hour gun battle between our security forces and the terrorists. We don't yet know the official death toll. The rescue is still ongoing, but the fight is over. Most of those killed were security forces. This hotel is popular with government officials and members of parliament. It's very close to the presidential palace, and the president was supposed to hold a meeting here with Somalia's five regional states. I was driving a tuk-tuk at the front of the hotel. I saw a car exploding at the gate of the hotel. I don't know where two of my clients have gone. I don't know if they're dead or alive, but I saw four dead bodies. Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility. The group remains active in Mogadishu and other urban areas even after being pushed out by African Union forces and the Somali government. And despite constant airstrikes by U.S. forces in areas still under the group's control. Government officials say they have prevented more attacks, but keeping people safe is proving difficult as Al-Shabaab continues to take control of surrounding districts. Catherine Soy, Al Jazeera. Okay, let's get more on that for you. Talking to us now, Abdi Ayinti. He's formerly a Somali Minister of Planning and International Cooperation. He joins us live now from Istanbul. Abdi Ayinti, putting the events of the past 36 hours together with what happened 10 days ago, some people are saying this is Somalia's 9 11. Is that a correct interpretation of what we're seeing? Uh, certainly the October 14 mega bombing was Somalia's 9-11. Over 400 people killed. Uh, many more are still missing. And the human and, and financial loss was simply unimaginable. I think people are, uh, are, are absolutely outraged right now and are waiting accountability by the government. I think there is just too many condolences going on coming out of the government right now. People want to hear that there is going to be some tangible steps that the government will take to prevent uh, repeated attacks by the terrorist group Al-Shabaab in Mogadishu and other places. What can the government do? Well, I think first of all, what we need to do is a paradigm shift in the standard operating procedures of the security services. Uh, I think the soldiers are doing everything they can, but they're not getting the necessary equipment, the uh, intelligence that they require. Our intelligence agency is still unable to simply eavesdrop on, on phone calls, and many of these attacks are organized by people who are using mobile phones. Uh, our SIM cards are not registered yet. And more importantly, a lot of financial transactions still take place with mobile money, and that is virtually unmonitored by the, uh, by the federal government of Somalia. And that is simply unacceptable in this day and age.
Al-Shabaab seems to be taking this and it seems to be capable of taking this to a whole new level. Is this the beginnings of a new campaign on their part? Well, I think Al-Shabaab has been at it for uh, well over a decade now, and it has ebbed and flowed. You had times where they would, uh, you know, increase the number of attacks and the seriousness of attacks. The October 14 mega bomb, which, by the way, they have not claimed because probably it was the worst, and they feared that it would uh, create a backlash, which it already did, certainly was another level. I think the more important thing, though, here is the, the government needs to do a little bit more, not only on the security front, but on the political front. Right now, the, the political crisis in Somalia is not conducive to, uh, to security and stability of the country. The, the federal government is in, uh, is in major uh, crisis with federal member states and various other political groups, and that is not helping the, the government. I was recently in Mogadishu a week ago, and the entire city is simply impassable right now. About 90 percent of the roads are closed. People are having a hard time moving from one location to the other. And we're still having attacks of this scale. So we really need to rethink uh, our strategy in terms of how we approach the whole security system, but more importantly, also the political uh, front. Abde Ayente there in Istanbul. Thank you. The bodies of 36 unidentified people have been found in a village near the eastern Libyan city of Benghazi. Some of the victims had signs of torture and gunshot wounds to the head. Locals say they were critics of the renegade general Khalifa Haftar, who controls the area. He has ordered an investigation. Kenya's main opposition leader has branded the presidential election rerun a sham and called for a new poll within 90 days. Raila Odinga met church leaders and supporters in Nairobi a day after the repeat vote was suspended due to violence. So far, the election commission is putting the president, Uhura Kenyatta, ahead of all other candidates with 97 per cent of the vote. Odinga spoke out against the post-election violence that's left at least six people dead. We want to condemn the militarization of politics in our country. We are continuing to see increasingly members in military uniform, police officers in combat gear, combing our towns, our villages, shooting aimlessly at our people. This shows to what levels the regime has descended. This, this regime has reached a level which is completely intolerable. Politics must be played by politicians. OK, our correspondent Mohamed Dado joins us live here on the news hour from Nairobi. Mohamed, uh, you've been gauging reaction there at the highest level. What are people saying? Well, uh, it depends on who you talk to, Peter. If you talk to the opposition supporters of Raila Odinga, they will tell you that this is a shambolic election. The numbers being uh, bundled and released uh, by the Electoral Commission, they say, are a lie and that the government is tinkering with the results as we speak. They point out that this was a much more easier and quicker process given that people were casting only one vote and that it shouldn't have taken all this long for results to be uh, announced. Uh, now, when you talk to the government, and I've been ju just got back from speaking to the v deputy president of Kenya, William Ruto, he says voter turnout has been at 40 percent. They've gotten uh, more than 7.5 million votes uh, cast uh, for President Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, so much is happening in terms of the to and fro coming from uh, the different parties. But what is most concerning to people is the emergence of militias who've been carrying out attacks and counter attacks in the slums of Nairobi and also in some parts of the country. That is what has many Kenyans concerned. How can those people who support Mr. Kenyatta say this election was free and fair? I mean, just watching the pictures a few days ago, there were obviously areas that were uh, democratically a complete vacuum. People weren't even getting to the polling stations. The international observers weren't going to the polling stations. Well, indeed, Peter, and we were out and about on that day when people were 
uh, not voting in some areas, particularly in opposition strongholds. We saw polling stations that did not open at all, and not just polling stations, but in four different counties of the country. Elections that, they, that might never take place again. There is absolutely no attempt from the government to even hold the elections again in those uh, places. There have also been uh, people who just simply boycotted as called for by Raila Odinga. But what the government is saying is that it is the constitutional right of anyone who wants to stay away from the election to stay away. And all that will count is how many votes have been cast and who has gotten the majority of those votes. So they say constitutionally, there's absolutely no problem with people boycotting the elections. Mohammed, we'll leave it there. Many thanks. Now, the leader of Iraq's Kurdish region is reportedly planning not to extend his presidential term. Masoud Barzani has been under pressure to quit following September's controversial secession referendum. The vote triggered more than 10 days of fighting between Iraqi and Kurdish forces. The parliament of Iraq's Kurdish region will meet in the coming hours to discuss a plan to redistribute powers as held today by Mr. Barzani. Steph Decker joins us live now from Abil. Steph, why have we not heard from Mr. Barzani on camera himself talking about this? That's a very good question. I don't have the answer to that. It seems to me uh, that, that, you know, the, the people here are being drip-fed uh, that final moment. Now, he has always said that he would not run in the November 1st elections. But, you know, the actual fact, when that is confirmed, when it happens, it is a big deal, Peter. So for the last two weeks or so, there's been rumours that he would be stepping down, he wouldn't be extending his term. And then he was supposed to announce it a few days ago, there were rumours that went away. Parliament was supposed to convene yesterday. That didn't happen. And then yesterday, sort of throughout the afternoon, in the evening, more and more sources were coming out saying the president had sent a letter here. Uh, to Kurdistan Regional Parliament, where he was uh, suggesting a way to, you know, disperse his powers for the interim period. Of course, November 1st is Wednesday. Uh, the Parliament voted to extend, to postpone the elections by eight months. So I think we're going to have to wait and see what exactly gets debated here. It's a closed session, but we are expecting them to tell us something at the end of that about how it looks. But certainly all indications seem to be that he will not be the president uh, as of Wednesday going forward. But does that mean as far as the people that do his job or whoever follows him, if he steps away from being in office, does he or does his family, more to the point, I guess, step away from being in power? That's the crucial issue here. Uh, the Barzanis are, you know, a dynastic family when it comes to this region. Together with the Talibanis, there's been, you know, splits and divisions among those two families for a very long time. Many people will tell you just because President Masoud Barzani is no longer officially the president, it means his powers are not waned. It is perhaps a way of simply sort of keeping the family's hold on power. There are rumours that perhaps that post in the interim will go to his nephew, the Prime Minister Netravan Barzani. He also has his son, Masrud, who is in charge of the security forces, the intelligence sort of apparatus. So the Barzani still have a substantial hold on power. But I think, you know, the sort of aftermath, the, the, the fallout of that referendum is that you do have divisions inside internal Kurdish politics. The opposition parties have a louder voice. They're trying to really, you know, play on this card where they blame him. Uh, for what we've seen, unexpected, really, loss of territory, disputed territory, of course, and also the fact that the federal government has said that it is going to take back control of all the border crossings that the KRG controls. They could do that, but it really, it's a massive step back from the status quo ante that they had. So certainly his critics will tell you that what he wanted to be his legacy uh, has become a huge mistake. But again, all of this, Peter, let's wait and see what we're going to hear over the next coming hours coming out of uh, the parliament. Understood. One last brief point, Steph. Does he risk making himself unpopular because the turnout was very healthy and the percentage of the vote in favour of secession was, relatively speaking, huge? Well, you know, Barzani has always said, actually, he was quoted in 2016 saying, you know, the day that there is an independent Kurdistan will be the day that I will cease. Uh, to be the president. He wanted this to be his legacy. You know, the referendum, he said, he went, it was their right, he said, and it was simply a yes or no vote. It wasn't legally binding. Supporters of him will say, well, you know, according to the Iraqi constitution, this should have been resolved, the disputed territories at least, 10 years ago. So we're just going to go ahead and do it anyway. It wasn't anything that had a legally binding point. Now, his opposition will tell you that it is all about timing. And he was warned by everyone, by the United States, by his allies, by Turkey, who was a neighboring 
friend that this was not the right time. According to sources, he was offered a deal to postpone the referendum by two years. And to those accounts, certainly he went ahead anyway. And certainly now we're seeing, you know, the KRG regionally isolated because you have Iran together with Turkey, together with Baghdad now trying to forge their own way. You have the United States who pretty much said Iraq needs to stay a unified country. Uh, it, the fallout is something that I don't think even he would have expected. So I think it's going to be very interesting if we finally hear from him what he is going to say. People will tell you he's not going to take responsibility and say he made a mistake. Again, this is all speculation, but I think it is significant to see what he has to say, how he has assesses uh, what has happened here over the last few weeks. Steph, thanks very much. Plenty more ground still to cover for you here on the news hour, including these stories. Hello, Jessa. I miss you so much, my daughter. A rare piece of good news for Filipinos searching for loved ones who disappeared in the fight against ISIL, but others weren't so lucky. And Cuba fights back against allegations that it was behind mysterious attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Havana. And in the sports news, a huge security operation is underway in Lahore as Pakistan prepares to host its most important cricket game since 2009. Government says the deposed Catalan leader, Carles Puigdemont, will be allowed to run in regional elections scheduled for December. Puigdemont is calling for a democratic and peaceful opposition to Madrid's direct rule of Catalonia. Now, the region lost its political autonomy after the Catalan parliament voted to declare independence. Hoda Abdelhamid has the latest for us here on the news out of Barcelona. Hoda, what do we think will happen next? Well, what we're thinking is going to happen next is something all, everyone is actually uh, worried about in this country. Certainly today you have uh, the people who do uh, want to remain uh, part of Spain. They want Catalonia to be part of Spain, who are on the streets making their voices uh, heard. And we're just at about an hour uh, before the official start of this protest, and there are already tens of thousands of people. And probably you can see in the background, they're carrying the Spanish flag, but they're also carrying the Catalan flag, which is the one with red, sort of thinner red and yellow stripes. Now, the message is they are Catalonian, but they are also Spaniards, and they want to remain uh, part of Spain. We've, hear, we've heard them singing uh, I Viva la España, for example, and then we heard them also uh, uh, shouting slogans against the deposed Catalan leader Carles Puigdemont saying uh, Puigdemont a prison, which means Puigdemont uh, should be in jail. Uh, so these are, the, they say that they are the majority. Uh, the Spanish media refers to them as the silent majority. Uh, but many of the people, you ask them, why didn't you go to the polls during the referendum? And they say, well, it was an illegal process in the first place. So we didn't want to be part of that process. And when he talks about democratic resistance, how far is he prepared to push people? I mean, does he want more demonstrations on the streets? Because those demonstrations in the immediate aftermath of the referendum looked pretty incendiary, almost pretty dangerous at points. Well, there is always that... Uh worry that maybe the, the, the pro-independence, the supporters of Carles Puigdemont would go down to the street in some sort of counter demonstration. But it has to be said that he did give a, a televised address yesterday and he did call on his supporters to have civil resistance, but he did underline the fact that everything had to remain peaceful. Uh, so uh, you don't get an, an, an impression here at the moment that there could be any kind of uh, disturbance later in the I think both sides of the divide, whether it's the central government in Madrid and uh, the deposed leader here, uh, both of them are making sure, or at least publicly, calling for everything to be peaceful. Also, because there were accusations in the past against Carlos Puigdemont, who had used maybe a bit of harsher rhetoric and more inciting rhetoric, and he was accused of uh, pushing his supporters uh, to some sort of civil disobedience. Now the message is all the contrary. Hoda, thanks very much. Big rallies taking place in Myanmar's biggest city in support of the military, which is facing standing criticism over the Rohingya crisis. Thousands of supporters have turned out on the streets of Yangon. 600,000 Rohingya Muslims have fled Rakhine State for Bangladesh over the past two months. They accuse the army of rape, murder, torture and arson.
the UN has called the violence, quote, textbook ethnic cleansing. Florence Louis joins us live now from Yangon. Florence, what's the signal they're sending out here with this protest today? Well, there's a protest organized by nationalists as well as military veterans. And it's essentially to show support to the military that's been accused of ongoing violence against the Rohingya minority um, in northern Rakhine state. Now, the people that we've spoken to here said they're out here, they want to defend the military against the criticism from the international community because they believe the Myanmar military is merely defending the country's sovereignty. And that is essentially the same line that Myanmar's military has been pushing, that its operation in northern Rakhine state is nothing more than a legitimate counteroffensive against a group that the Myanmar government has designated as a terrorist organization. Now, at the rally, we also heard another narrative that was being pushed by extreme nationalist right-wing monks. Now, they were also saying that the Rohingya Muslim minority in northern Rakhine state were trying to implement um, an Islamic form of governance in certain parts of the country. And this is what the Myanmar military is fighting against. But this is something for which there is no proof. How much of the protests we're looking at, and we're looking at pictures that we've uh, lifted from Facebook there, I noticed, how much of this protest is in the minds of the people who are demonstrating clearly uh, separate from supporting the military or supporting the civilian government because again over the past two or three days there's been silence from Aung San Suu Kyi. That's a very good question. Now rallies such as these are really rare simply because the military isn't a particularly popular institution. It ruled the country for nearly 50 years before allowing it to undergo a democratic transition in 2010. And as you've mentioned, a civilian government is in charge now. But the military is still a very, pop, uh, is still a very powerful institution in this country. Now, as one analyst pointed out, though, that the support and the fact that this event was held doesn't necessarily equate to blanket support for the military. Now, in this instance, in the handling of the Rakhine crisis and the refugee crisis, the military appears to be on the same page as the government and the de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. She has been silent, she hasn't spoken up for the Rohingya, and she's been criticised not only for that, but also for defending the military's actions. So, really, the support here can also be taken as support for not just the military, but also the government. Florence, thanks very much. Benjamin Zawaki is an independent Southeast Asia analyst. He joins us on Skype now from Hua Hien in Thailand. Benjamin Zawaki, I'm not being sarcastic here. What is the point of having that protest when the people started leaving that northern state of Rakhine at the end of August and there are 600,000 plus of them now living in a semi-permanent state across the border in Bangladesh? Why, why does the military and the civilian government feel the need to put together that kind of demonstration? Well, they're clearly very, very sensitive to the criticism that they've been receiving by, by the West. Uh, most recently, the United States has proposed uh, targeted sanctions against uh, certain members of the military, and the country simply doesn't appreciate, and as you rightly point out, neither the military nor the civilian government appreciates the kind of criticism coming from the West. It also needs to be pointed out, however, that the criticism is, in fact, limited to the camp of the international community led by, for example, the United States and Europe, and does not include China and another whole block of the international community, uh, which has had nothing but, but praise and support for, for the response to the Rohingya crisis. And is there anything in the imagery of this that we're watching now, and it's pretty strong stuff, that if you were a Rohingya Muslim who's literally fled from what your life was before and you were only existing and living in what you're standing up in and you're living in a refugee camp. Is there anything that you're seeing in Yangon today that would make you believe that trickle-down message that we've had from the civilian government and the military over the past, what, three weeks, saying, look, come back, it'll be OK, we will address these issues? No, it's fairly clear that those statements were made for the benefit of, of the Western camp uh, in response to its criticism. But if you're a Rohingya living in Bangladesh at the time, at this moment, you're seeing not only what has happened to you personally, not only the, the, the death in, uh, of family members, the raising of villages, um, the confiscation and, sa and, and sale of your cattle, 
But now you're seeing a, a, a rally as far as far away as Yangon that has rightly been pointed out seems to be not only supported by the military itself, but also by the civilian government led by Aung San Suu Kyi. The message is clear and it's unequivocal that you are not welcome back. Uh, and, and that if you do come back, there's really not much to return to. There's nothing by way of physical infrastructure for you. And certainly there's no political uh, support for you nationwide. Not wishing to put words into your mouth, Benjamin Zawaki. Do you get the sense, however, that the military and also the civilian government, Aung San Suu Kyi, beyond making the right noises for those people who want to impose even more sanctions on the government there, that they cannot or will not do any more than they have done, i.e., will it become the status quo? There will be now 600,000 Rohingya who live in a semi-permanent state across the border in Bangladesh. Yes, it's essentially mission accomplished, right? The UN has called it textbook ethnic cleansing. What you have is a northern Rakhine state that has been cleansed ethnically of its Rakhine, or sorry, of its Rohingya population. And given the message that's being sent today, or, or rather being reinforced today, there's not a whole lot more that the civilian government needs to say uh, because, because how many more people are there, really? And more people are still leaving the country than, than are coming back. And so once a, once a region is cleansed of, of a constituency uh, that has no domestic champion and whose international champions are the West, far away, and with a tenuous relationship at best with the government, uh, there's not much more that needs to, to be done in Yangon to, to maintain this. Benjamin Zwaki, thanks very much. Now, in a few moments, we'll have the weather with Everton, but also still ahead here on the News Hour. Togo's president breaks his silence after months of protests against him. As Lebanon's cannabis trade turns sour, some farmers are finding luck with a new crop. And in the sports news, a ninth innings turnaround sees the Dodgers leveling the World Series. Andy's here with that story in about 20 minutes. Just a week ago, Typhoon Lan was hitting Japan. Now we're looking at another system making its way through. It's been downgraded to a tropical storm, but uh, in this case, we are still looking at some damaging winds, 140 kilometers per hour on those gusts. It will move through very quickly, though, 37 kilometers per hour, pushing further northeastwards. It'll pass very close to Tokyo within the next two or three hours or so. But really, I think a greater significance will be the amount of rainfall that we have coming through ahead of the storm We've already seen 65 millimetres of rain coming in to uh, Tokyo. And further south, some massive rainfall totals, 264 millimetres of rain there in uh, Kyushu, just to the south of this location. Nearly half a metre of rain has fallen in the space of just one day. The wetter weather, the uh, windy weather, is now making its way further northeast, which, as I said, within the next two or three hours, Tokyo will see the centre of the storm passing a very close by flooding rains, mudslides certainly a possibility. It will sweep its way through as we go on through Monday. And by this time tomorrow, we're looking at the system making its way away from Hokkaido. It'll be gone by the time we come to uh, Tuesday, but floods will continue. You're watching Al Jazeera. A reminder of our top stories this hour. Security forces in Somalia have ended a siege more than 10 hours after Al-Shabaab gunmen stormed a hotel holding hostages in the capital, Mogadishu. The attack has detonated two bombs that killed at least 23 people and injured dozens more. Kenya's main opposition leader has branded the presidential election rerun a sham and called for a new vote within 90 days. So far, the election commission is putting President Uhura Kenyatta ahead with 97% of the vote. Thousands of people are marching in Yangon in support of Myanmar's army. The minority Muslim Rohingya community accuses the military of rape, murder, torture and arson in Rakhine State. 600,000 of them have fled in the past two months. <clears throat> the UN's emergency relief coordinator has described the humanitarian crisis in Yemen as shocking. The country is grappling with a cholera epidemic, famine and a civil war that shows no sign of ending. Here's Victoria Gatenby. Shocking and horrendous. That's how the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator describes the suffering he's seen in Yemen. During his five-day visit, Mark Lowcock saw severely malnourished children, hospitals with barely any electricity, and met health workers who've not been paid for months. It's been shocking to see the terrible impact of this man-made conflict. All parties in Yemen 
and those outside who support and have influence over them must do much more to ensure they respect international humanitarian law and protect civilians. Saudi Arabia and its allies launched a military campaign in March 2015 against Houthi rebels and forces loyal to former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. The Saudi-led coalition has been bombing the capital Sana'a and other parts of Yemen to try to restore the internationally recognized government of President Abid Rabi Mansour Hadi. Hadi, based temporarily in Aden, says the Houthis must disband. But they insist they're Yemen's legitimate authority and accuse him of being a Saudi puppet. We are ready to work towards a solution. We say to all Yemeni groups, let's find a solution. The foreign powers involved aren't here to fight for you. They are here for their interests. We're ready to walk towards a solution, but there should be at least a response from the other side instead of waiting for decisions to come from Abu Dhabi or Saudi Arabia. While the Houthis say they're ready to talk, they're also threatening to intensify their retaliation against Saudi Arabia and strike military targets in the UAE. More than 10,000 Yemenis have been killed and almost 40,000 injured over two and a half years of fighting. Human rights groups accuse both sides of committing atrocities. The UN is urging all sides to negotiate a political deal. Until they do, the world's number one humanitarian crisis may only get worse. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. The Togo president has spoken for the first time since a wave of protests began in August. At least 16 people have been killed in anti-government demonstrations demanding presidential term limits. Fari Gasengbe took power in 2005, cementing his family's 50-year rule. Here's Charlotte Bellis. There was no sign of the unrest gripping Togo as Fauna Singbe walked into his party's annual congress. The Togolese president spoke publicly for the first time since violence aimed at him erupted two months ago. You will agree with me that we are going through a tough political crisis in the country. Today, those who intoxicate, those who lie, have found allies in technology and can turn a righteous thing, a simple man like me, into a bloodthirsty dictator. Until now, Nasingbe has stayed off the public stage since opposition parties rallied to introduce a two-term limit for the presidency. He took power in 2005 after the death of his father, who ruled Togo for 38 years. It's Africa's longest-serving political dynasty. Hundreds of thousands of people have rallied for the end of Nsingbe family rule since August. Opposition leaders say that instead of listening to the demands of the people, the government has orchestrated a brutal crackdown. At least 16 people have been killed. We will free ourselves. We will fight by all means necessary. It's very important for us. We have the people on our side. And yet the president says he remains serene and optimistic. This joyful moment we're sharing should not let us forget that we are going through a crisis. It is true that we have also gone through difficult moments in the past and we have to be bold, courageous and patient to embrace the situation. His party's Congress was a safe platform to address the socio-political crisis, but West African leaders want him to do more. The region's trade bloc and the African Union fear the instability, with hundreds fleeing Togo to Ghana because of the unrest. Charlotte Ballas, Al Jazeera. Cuba is denying any involvement in alleged sonic attacks that led to more than 20 U.S. embassy staff being recalled from Havana. The U.S. says the staff were injured at their offices and their homes. Washington says Havana failed in its obligation to protect diplomats on its territory. Cuba says there's no evidence the attacks actually took place. Mike Hanna has more now from Washington. Relations between the U.S. and Cuba continue to deteriorate in the wake of what U.S. officials describe as a covert sonic attack. Last month, the U.S. withdrew all non-essential personnel from the embassy in Havana following what they said was a series of staff falling ill 
because of some kind of sonic attack. Now, the U.S. did not provide any evidence and said that it could not establish exactly uh, what the so-called attack was. But now Cuba is fighting back. Uh, the foreign minister is visiting D.C. at the moment, and this is what he had to say. The so-called attacks are unjust. Whatever the type of attack, whatever the incident, it is completely false. The foreign minister also described the whole incident as, and I quote, political manipulation aimed at damaging bilateral relations. Now, important to note that the U.S. has never directly accused Cuba of being responsible for the illness of its diplomats. However, it did say that Cuba has not done enough to investigate the causes of this. Cuba's position very clearly. There is no such attacks underway. There have been no attacks. And even if there were, certainly Cuba has got nothing to do with it. But all of this has got to be seen as well in the context of the Trump administration. Relations with Cuba were reestablished under Obama. Under the Trump administration, things have changed substantially. From the very beginning, uh, President Trump making very clear he's not that happy with these increasingly warm relations with Cuba. Now we've seen a continual deterioration emerging from these claims of some kind of covert sonic attack. The search for those who went missing during the siege of the city of Marawi in the Philippines continues. The government declared victory over pro-ISIL fighters earlier this month after months of conflict there. Jamila Alindogan has the story of one woman who received good news about her daughter who'd been kidnapped. We met Josie Epanes a few months ago. Back then, she was trying to retrieve her husband's body in a morgue. Leonardo Epanes died in Marawi in the southern Philippines. He was working there as a waiter when a pro-ISIL group called the Maute took control of several parts of the city last May. Their daughter Jessa was missing too. Josie asked for help from the police and the military, looking for signs that may lead to her daughter. The days dragged into months and she was already losing hope. Months later, we traveled to Josie's hometown in Iligan to tell her the good news. <laughs> Jessa was held hostage by the Maute group, but after months in captivity, she was able to escape. We brought her to Marawi hoping that the military could help facilitate the reunion. But it is not easy. A bureaucratic process has to play out. Still, they are lucky enough to talk to each other on the phone. Hello, Jessa. I miss you so much, my daughter. Ma, I'm okay. I love you, ma. I miss you. I'm so happy you are alive. Papa is dead. They killed him, ma. No, hindi pa mo, Papa Sam. When the Maotas seized parts of Marawi City, hoping to set up an Islamic state, its fighters took several thousand civilians hostage. In the course of the months-long battle, many civilians have either been released or escaped. Government records show less than 80 families have registered their missing. Human rights experts say that number may be higher. That is because many fear the stigma, that if they come forward registering their missing loved ones, their relatives may be accused of collaborating with the Maute. The Philippine military has declared Marawi liberated from the pro-ISIL group. After months of fighting, most of Marawi is now left in ruins. Over a thousand people have died and hundreds of thousands more displaced. You cannot really heal, you know, the wounds. You really have to reunite people. Another set of bodies retrieved from the front line. In this small bag are bones of five people. Like so many others here, they will be buried in a mass grave. Nameless victims of a brutal conflict. Jamal Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Marawi City, Southern Philippines. Australia's former Deputy Prime Minister has started his campaign to be re-elected to the Parliament there. On Friday, the High Court ruled that Barnaby Joyce was a dual citizen and therefore could not serve under the rules of the Constitution. Mr Joyce has renounced his New Zealand citizenship and is a favourite to retain his seat. Um, the Deputy Prime Ministership has been held in abeyance and that's the big one. And... Um, uh, let's hope that if the people of New England find it in their hearts to uh, give me a run at it again after the 2nd of December that we can fix that problem up right, right away. 
When we come back, Andy's here with the sports news, including this one. Venus Williams makes history in Singapore as she moves within sight of the WTA title. Six two, six. New 